Uh, we're going to uh, continue uh, developing uh, page art and uh, ship diagrams for the upcoming book that we are releasing on the DMs Guild, Spelljammer Combat and Exploration, a deep dive into uh, ship movement and observing things in space. So uh, give me a second here to check my signals and then we'll get into this for probably about an hour maybe or so. Hold on real quick. For probably see. about an hour maybe or so. Hold on. That sounds fantastic. Voice is luscious today. An indication of uh, poor rest. <laughs> so cheers to that. Uh, I've just posted that I'm live on Twitter. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that notification popping up. Uh, I'm at Phil Kearney, like in my description down below. My name is Phil Kearney. Hi. So hey, uh, I'm, I'm just going to kick to my spiel real quick here, and then we'll get into uh, art assets and stuff. So hi, my name is Phil Kearney. Uh, I create role-playing game supplements in PDF format. I focus my attention, uh, attention currently on 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, in the description down below, there is a slew of work that I have already produced. Uh, various links down below lead you to uh, uh, books that I've already published. They're all 100% free previews. So if you click on a book, um, you, can, uh, you can look at the entire thing cover to cover. Uh, there's about 150 different illustrations across the books that are linked down below. Um, if you click on a book and go into its individual product page, uh, on a mobile phone, you'll see an eye icon on the right-hand side of the screen. If you're on a tablet or a desktop, underneath the cover image, like, like something like this, uh, underneath that, you'll see a link that says full preview. Click the full preview or an eye icon. Either way, it throws open a PDF for the entire document. You can read it cover to cover, look at the illustrations. If you're an art enthusiast, if you're a D&D &D enthusiast, be welcome to check out all the character combat campaign mechanics that I've been building for people to make use. Um, if you think this stuff is cool, consider making a purchase to support the stream and uh, and the you know the work in general. Um, otherwise, uh, we can uh, support the channel by liking, subscribing, hitting the bell icon, and we're going to dive into this. So, hey, if you're new here, I'm here six days a week streaming content. Uh, it, whether it's Spelljammer, Eberron Cartography, or um, new character mechanic development for new books that will be released probably in the new year. So we've always got something new in the iron, um, new, a new iron in the, in the fire and uh, work on the bench to hammer through. So we do that here on stream so folks can see um, what it takes to be, uh, you know, to, to put out a book. This is 100 pages long. Uh, here's our document currently. Uh, that we've been working uh, we use word as our layout program super professional but um, it word is heavily uh, you know easily accessible doesn't cost me anything I already own it so it's easy peasy to use and uh, we've been fighting our way through the combat chapter so what I'm doing today right now anyway is uh, we've got this uh, we've got this page that's dedicated to changing scale during combat and if you've been around here for a while, you, you know that this movement system that we use is all about transitioning from uh, different scales to, move, to close distance so that you don't have to worry about having 500 feet of table space to be able to have a space battle between a hammerhead ship that takes 50 inches of space on your board uh, versus a star moth that takes like... 40 inches on your board. So it's like the, the scale is ridiculous. So we had to rebuild how scale works in D&D. &D. And uh, so the, the, the first half of this book is mostly about how do ships work and how do ships move and engage in combat. And then the ha later half of the book, um, it's about uh, how to interact and explore in space, identifying, noticing objects, um, hazards that exist. There's also a chapter on upscaling spellcasting to impact things at great distance. And then the back 25 pages of the 100 page document is a conversion guide to play Light as Araxis from Wizards of the Coast using the Spelljammer combat and exploration mechanics that we've been building for the past seven months. So once it's published, it'll also be 100% free preview for you guys. So basically, this is like a really long tail intro preview. Of the, of the book, we're, we're doing artwork here. We've been doing NPC tokens for the Light of Zaraxxus. Uh, we've already done a crap load of uh, um, uh, vehicle and creature 
tokens that we can use to populate this book in spot illustration positions on different pages, as well as use for diagrams. So as I was saying uh, today, we're gonna work on some more of that diagram. We're just trying to figure out how to, we've, we've really been getting our gears ground uh, by uh, uh, basically talking through the mechanic. Like it's easy for me to explain verbally and in a session as a DM to somebody how to how changing scale mechanics work, but parsing it out on paper where I can't actually engage you in conversation. It needs to be thorough and it needs to be um, self-referencing and it needs to have a lot of visuals so it's easy for people that learn in different ways to just grok the content in general, you know? So that is, that's, the, that's the grand challenge that we've given ourselves throughout this, uh, throughout this quest. So what we're gonna do right now is we're going to take ye old Photoshop and we're going to pluck this page from the document, create a PDF, and then we're just gonna start messing around with text blocks and creating space to put illustrations and diagrams in. So I'm not sure if this is exciting content for you or not, but one of the goals of this channel is to show you the different steps of being, uh, of creating a, a PDF for a role-playing game, an instruction manual, a technical manual that's designed to structure imagination. Role-playing is not an easy hobby. So if, you're, if this stuff is cool to you, uh, definitely please like and subscribe because most of the time I'm doing artwork and cartography. But on Saturday, um, I, I kill my stream uh, by, uh, by doing layout stuff and showing how stuff fits on pages. So if this stuff is cool to you or you're interested in potentially producing your own published content, this is, you know, be welcome to ask me questions and stuff, but we got work to do, so we gotta get the work done. What page are we on? Page 15 out of 109. Once we get rid of all, I mean, there's a lot of garbage. There's a lot of scrap that I've got laying around here of me taking different, like me making different takes on how do I explain how to change scale. And, and as I lock down the mechanics and language that I like, uh, I drop it into a page, put in a lot of illustrations, and, uh, and then push to the next page. So we're, uh, right now, uh, we're digging through the actual procedural step process of changing scale from like 500 feet to 50 feet to five feet or five to 50 to 500 back and forth. That's literally what, that, that's literally the, what we're doing right now. Like there's the idea of, oh, I get it. You can zoom in the map so that you can see closer to your ship. You need assets for that, the visual assets, which I provided. And you also need the sense of scaling to do that on your maps, which we've also laid out. But then there's the actual mechanical process, like when during your turn or during an encounter in combat, do you as a player or the DM change the scale of map for you to interact with objects at closer, at closer distances? So that's what's on this page. And we're gonna walk through that process here as soon as we get to it. So we're going to extract this page as a document without any properties or structural tags for accessibility. Uh, we're gonna call it, let's see. We're gonna call it SCE Layout 420 Combat. Uh, we'll, we'll do um, Scaling Movement Page 15. That's what we'll call this document for us to extract. And now we'll go into Photoshop. Since I can since I can do my own artwork, I obviously have a significant leg up over most of the creators out there that are trying to produce these things because I have the uh, uh, the uh, the gift of um, uh, the advantage of being able to create my own art. So I can customize each page specifically to what I want it to be. Right now I'm looking for that 420 scaling movement. There we go. Opens up as a 300 DPI, eight and a half by 11 page with no background as you can see. And so then we're going to go find our background texture image. Hold on, let's see. Chessex background fade. That's this is the background that we're currently using, which will probably change in some manner when we get to the page dressing.
portion of the work. I'll put a lock on that. This is called text there. So this is a page that will eventually end up here, right? This is how the text is currently arranged. I love this three column format, by the way. It is very, this is a, this is a great book, man. You've got, uh, we've got instances of uh, single column work, instances of two column, and uh, back to uh, one page, like mixing different columns and spacing on the page. And then we're, uh, we're breaking into three columns here to be able to, like this is a 500 foot scale map, a 50 foot scale map, and a five foot scale map. And we can describe them in tandem by having a three column format that each map drops into. So here on the changing scale during combat and the shifting focus sections, we again have this three, this, this three panel format for the different scales sliding between each other. But um, I'm, A, I'm not happy with these hanging widows. So I think what I wanna do here for a moment is Let's see what happens if we dive in closer to this. So at the 500 foot scale, generally, let's let's just read this page with everybody because this is what we're basically doing. This is in a two, this is in a two column format here. So I have space here, obviously for a quarter page illustration, and there's enough space down here for, and here, for probably another, uh, maybe another uh, third, of, uh, um, 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 eighth of a page. So. I actually have a lot of space available throughout the document for me to drop illustrations into, but this is a lot of wasted space down here. I could, under normal circumstances, I could put a spot illustration down here, but I actually need every inch of this page for me to be able to build the diagrams showing how to transition from one scale of map to another. So I'm going to have to be uh, aggressive with how I make use of my, uh, uh, my column space. So that's making me want to reevaluate already how I have this stuff sitting on the page. So uh, at the 500 foot scale, generally all, let's just read the whole thing to you so you can see what it is that we're talking about right now, right? So changing scale during combat, as detailed above on the previous pages, um, you can change, um, as, as detailed above, you can change the scale of distance between ships and targets while moving during combat. The ship that characters are aboard is simultaneously present on the 500 50 and five foot scale maps. Since weapons can't attack a target more than one mile away, 500 feet is the largest scale necessary. Oops, button. Since weapons can't attack a target more than 500 feet away, 500 feet, uh, than one mile away, 500 feet is the largest scale necessary during combat and while targets remain within range, they can be placed on the 500 foot scale map with your ship and any other significant objects relevant to the encounter. If there are no targets less than 500 feet away, the 50 foot scale map can be ignored until a target is close enough to be placed on this map. Similarly, the five foot scale map isn't necessary until a target is close enough to your ship to use it. For example, if a 50 foot scale map is placed on a 10 by on a 10 by 10 grid, your ship and target must be within 500 feet to be placed on this map. Hopefully that makes sense, but we're going to make an illustration over here showing a 10 by 10 grid map at the 50 foot scale with two ships on it to illustrate that point. Uh, so that's that's the gist of it. You don't use a map unless you're within range to use that map. Otherwise, it's not necessary at the table. Up here, you can see organizing combat. And I have a, a, a spacing issue here that I need to fix. But organizing combat maps, right? So changing scale during combat can be visualized by placing each scale on a separate map. The illustration below represents a 34 inch by 48 inch battle map commonly used while playing in person. Virtual tabletops like Roll20, let me make sure this is out of the way. I don't need this open. Keeping my window clean. So uh, the illustration below represents a 34 inch by 48 inch battle map commonly used while playing in person. Virtual tabletops like Roll20 can accommodate uh, significantly larger grids. Uh, the grid is divided into three sections, 500 foot scale to the left, 50 foot scale in the middle, and five foot scale to the right. 
So if you don't know this, ChessX is, um, is kind of a, uh, a, an old school industry leader in role playing games in that it has a vellum, it's basically a, a vinyl scroll that you can roll up and then unfurl at your table. And the largest size that they typically, I mean, they have some mega size, but the largest size that we typically use at the kitchen table is 34 inches wide by 48 inches. There's also like a, I think there's a 16 by 24. There's also a 20 by 20. I think there's a 26 by 30, 20, yeah. 26 by, th no, it was a 24 by 36. I already mentioned that one. Yeah, so they have various sizes. And on a virtual tabletop, you can have a grid up to 100 by 100 squares. So a virtual tabletop can be, it can be literally twice as wide and three times as tall as what we see here for really huge battles, but that's not convenient at the kitchen table. These are conveniently, this, uh, if, if your table's like mine, you've got the 34 inch by 40 inch grit, you can see how you can break this up into different sections. We need to flesh out the visuals, like the, the ships and stuff on this, but for now the grid fits. We are mostly using this to size the grid. So now that we know the sizing here works, um, we can flesh out this, uh, this illustration as well, which we may or may not do today. So at the 500 foot scale, which here is represented as 16 uh, by uh, 16 wide, 30 long, uh, the illustration aboard depicts an asteroid base which occupies a one mile space. This will be A. Uh, a fleet of star maws and flitters, which will be here B, uh, is defending the citadel, is defending the asteroid, is defending the base uh, from a fleet of enemy ships C, which we haven't placed on the map yet. Uh, the asteroid is a relatively immobile object on the map that can be used as a point of reference while ships move and make ranged attacks around it. Uh, with no significant objects, when no significant objects are present, the blank grid map can be used during combat while traveling between worlds. Like, if you don't have a big significant object on the map, then it's basically a blank space map like this, and the, and the grid scale is anything that you want it to be. So anyway, that's the language that's going on there. So when we're shifting focus between these different map scales, uh, the illustrations below depict how combat shifts focus from one map to another when you're close enough to a target to change scale relative to it. So um, now we have our three category breakdown, the 500 foot scale, 50 foot scale, and five foot scale maps. At the 500 foot scale, generally all relevant ships and creatures not aboard uh, ships not aboard ships themselves, can be placed on this map. If a ship, like if you're just free floating through space, technically you would occupy your own square, regardless of what your size is. If you're aboard a ship you're and you're smaller than that ship, that ship, that ship space uh, subsumes the space that you occupy. You're occupying that ship, so only the ship is represented until you get down to the five foot scale to show where your character is literally on the deck of this ship. So, and, but we'll have illustrations here to demonstrate that. So, at the 500 foot scale, generally all relevant ships and creatures not aboard ships themselves can be placed on this map. If a ship increases scale to move away from combat, uh, remove it, remove it from the map unless you choose to pursue the target as described in the pursuit section down below. Uh, when a ship moves to a square adjacent to a target at the 500 foot scale, you can close distance by placing it and the target on the 50 foot scale map five squares apart. And if you choose, use any remaining movement. If that space is occupied, place the target in the next farthest square relative to your position on the map. So yeah, that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we need to build a diagram to visualize. You just shift your focus from this map at the 500 foot scale. And then when we have ships here at the 50 foot scale, they're closer. Then you just shift your attention to where we're at on the map here. Um, this state specifically, uh, 50 foot scale maps typically require less space. Uh, 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 ships remain present at the 500 foot scale. 
uh, the, the ship depicts, um, the, this scale depicts ship's closing distance from 500 feet scale map to make ship melee attacks in addition to ranged attacks. So 50 foot scale maps typically require less space than maps at other scales because ships must be very close to their target to use ship melee weapons. If you don't want to engage in melee combat, presumably you're going to move away from that threat, which pushes you back out uh, refocuses your attention to the 500 foot scale because you're actively yeeting away from that ship so you don't have to you know you don't have to grapple with it so that's that's the idea there you're simultaneously existing on the 550 and five foot scale maps it's just a matter of do I need the 50 or 500 or a five foot scale map or am I only using the 500 foot scale map right now so if you cordon off these different spaces this 500 foot space could be something you've already prepped like this uh this uh this asteroid based challenge that we have uh in in the book um with the fleet of star moths protecting it this is a static battlefield map because this star moth is a relatively stationary object so these flit these these star moths can advance and move around the battlefield but if you move like further away from the star moth over here you're basically leaving the battle so as long as you're staying close proximity to the object that's affixed in your battlefield, you're staying within range. And if you want to use a bigger map or position the moth in the center of the map or change your proportions, so like this is the size that you're using or the entire 48 by 34 inch map space is, is the 500 foot scale for you. And then you have a separate map altogether that you can pick up and place like on a TV tray that's like a 20 inch by 20 inch space that you use while doing five foot scale combat and it just sits on the side. And then you have this other map that could also sit on the side, like in its own TV tray or like a side table that you can, that you can just address your attention to as ships close distance to the five foot scale. It's, it's more involved than what normal D&D at the five foot scale is, but D&D, this is the only campaign setting other than Dragonlance and Descent into Avernus that deal with these massive sizes. So we've used Descent into Avernus as our testing ground for these mechanics before we rebuilt Light of Zaraxa. So that will be a campaign we can rebuild using these scaling mechanic rules as well. And Dragonlance dealing with armies can also use the scaling mechanics, but you'd be having dozens or hundreds of troops under your command at these different scales as opposed to like a hireling or a sidekick on your character's team or like i summon dogs you know like that can operate on the five foot scale but well it's like i summon 500 zombies it's like well we should probably take that to the 50 foot scale for you to resolve that and i have previous playtest content like the very front end of this playtest content uh, of this playlist is the playtest content fighting zombies and stuff in El Terrell from Descent into Avernus. So, anyway. Um, so, that is uh, when a ship moves to a square adjacent to the target. Blah, blah, blah. So, that's that's basically how that works. Uh, what we're currently looking to do is... Uh, uh, if there's no targets, uh, as detailed above, you can change the scale of distance between ships and targets while moving during combat. The ship can target uh, can uh, the ships uh, characters are aboard is simultaneously present in the 55, 550 and five foot scales. Since weapons can't attack a target uh, largest scales five hundred feet, there's no intent to for example. Uh, there we go. For example, if a fifty foot scale map is placed on a, a ten by ten grid, which we need to fix that, uh, your ship and target must be within five hundred feet to be placed on this map. So what I want to do is take just a I bet I have something I can use already yeah I can oops this is the wrong map that's the JPEG I used into the book uh, what I want is the PDF 14 there we go SCE combat Hey, Marshall, how does the initiative 
and actions change when you zoom in and out. For example, the PCs board an enemy ship and engage in the five foot scale. How do you handle what other scales of combat are doing? They're all done simultaneously. Um, thanks for asking, by the way, and thanks for showing up. Like and subscribe, man. I talk about the, when uh, when this book publishes, it'll be 100% free preview, and I'll do a complete walkthrough front to end. But uh, the ship rolls that you play defines how you use your action economy. Um, so let's check that out real quick since you're asking. Ship roles. You can either be a pilot, a siege commander, a squadron commander, or a support character. So the pilot role is, I need to, so you can see the, the tail of the P, there you go. Uh, so role, pilot, uh, you move the ship and you attack with ship melee weapons. A siege commander command, commands the siege crew to attack with ranged siege weapons. Uh, the squadron commander commands allies ships to move and attack and then the support character assists pilots and commanders with their action economy So you have to be focusing on a helm to be a pilot and we have uh, it, uh, Up above in the equipment section. We describe what a, a mounted orrery does uh, the little orrery that they have in spell jammer is like a little device that will pick up planetary sized objects inside of a system when you uh, enter that space the exploration section down below goes into a deep dive about if you use that orrery while you're focusing in a spell jammer ship, it creates a, a radar system that like a, a mounted orrery gets mounted into an orrery station, which is a five foot space object, kind of like a helm that's specifically for visualizing and tracking objects through space. So a siege commander, if he has eyes and means of communicating by like a far gab, a messenger stone, whatever it is that you're using to communicate with other ships, the siege, the squadron commander can can issue commands to uh, the ships that you control, similar to how a siege commander can issue commands to siege weapons that are aboard your ship. It just scales out to a larger size of a, a larger fleet that you're having control of. So the action economy is what you expect from fifth edition. Verbal, inter, uh, verbal is basically like verbal commands, like you know, dog attack, that sort of thing. Uh, interaction is like the object interaction that you have a free object interaction each round as per player's handbook and we use it to steer so while you're a pilot you can use your free object interaction during a round of combat to move your ship um, other inter like the squadron commander also uses object interaction through the orrery focus to issue commands for where you want ships to move positions to as well um, verbal commands are used to take command of a siege weapon like you guys follow me now is basically what that verbal command is and then you start using your action economy to issue them commands while you control them and then characters can rotate through initiative to take control of siege crews one after another you can all share use of command of these of both siege weapons as well as other ships in your squadron and then the verbal support doesn't really require uh, any kind of interaction or verbal things to do it. Uh, but you do have to be, burp, burp, but you do have to be focused on an orrery to be able to have that same awareness of everything on your ship, like a pilot does while they're on the helm. While you're focusing on an orrery, you can see anywhere you want on or around your ship from any position, just like a spell jamming helm. That allows you to be able to communicate with, inspire. Uh, provide a flash of insight, um, help uh, weapon crews target, um, help um, um, find incoming threats, or give your pilot a head up that damage is incoming from weapons to dodge. That's kind of what the support does. They're a lookout that uses the orrery system in their own eyes, if applicable, to be able to manipulate or to manipulate the dice rolls of other characters on the ship. But you can also mix and match your action economy. So the actions that a pilot can use is like you can disengage from an attack. You can use the defense action to basically up your armor class. Um, you can use the hide action to duck close to a larger object so that you won't show up on an enemy ship's orrery. So you become basically radar blind. Um, obviously the move ship action, it's like, a it's like a dash action. So you can move so much as steering and then you can commit more action economy to move your ship further if you want. But that would also deny you like making attacks 
and your iterative attacks as a pilot you can do a ship melee attack as an attack action with iterative attacks as like a level level fighter with three attacks per round you could potentially issue up to three commands for a siege weapon or an entire squadron to make a volley of attacks and there's mechanics about reloading and action economy but basically as long as you can hit different dcs while you're making attack rolls it determines if your team is automatically reloading the weapon to fire again as part of the action uh the command to issue an attack so you can make multiple attacks per round with siege weapons if you're able to hit a high enough number that your team is just in the flow that they're reloading the weapon and firing at will if you botch your roll then you have to use additional action economy to get them back on task to get that fucking weapon loaded now so that way you have to either burn a bonus action uh you you burn your either an action like an attack action instead of firing you have to reload or a reaction is like crap you screwed up let me help you get that reloaded and then you can also use a bonus action to attack so yeah so instead of having a separate initiative no yeah it's all the same action economy if i am the pilot of the sh like if i'm on like a flitter ship that's or like a, something really small like a skiff that's only like 15 feet long with a minor helm i can still kick around at you know 100 miles per round if i need to but it's an open deck ship so I can have, I can be at my helm. I can have a, a ballista team on the back end of it, and uh, and I can have a uh, a crossbow loaded in my arms. So I can use my interaction as a pilot to move the skiff. I can then, if I wanted to, either attack, like if the skiff has a, has a ram, for instance, I could ram. I could use that ram to make a ship melee attack, or instead, I could like use my action to um, fire my uh, my crossbow bolt. If I'm a fighter with like two attacks per round, I could use a verbal command to have my ballista team fire a round of ballista, and if they screw up the reload, then I could burn my reaction that round to reload the weapon, or I could use my second attack to reload the weapon, or I could use my bonus action to attack again. So what I could, what the smart way would be, would be to, I pilot my ship, I make an attack action with my ballista, and depending on whether they reload it or not, I can then use my reaction to reload the weapon. I could then use my other uh, normal attack action to either attack again with the ballista, or ballistas are huge weapons, so they can't attack individual creatures on other ships if those creatures have any type of cover. The, the ballista bolt is too big to hit them, so I would then use my crossbow to shoot the pilot of the other ship if I could see them so I could potentially disrupt his concentration and stop him from moving so then I could use uh, my bonus action to attack that enemy ship because their pilot is scuttled right now and he can't defend his ship against my ram attack I'm going to have advantage on causing like to knock their ship over I could like if I have a piercing ram I could then initiate a grappling attack as a bonus action if I had one available still but I you could freely mix and match all of these actions together it's just how much action economy does your character have to do these different things the kicker is like having Having a pilot, like be a, like a marshal, having uh, being your pilot gives you more marshal attacks, like gives you more attacks so you can do more ship melee attacks. Um, having a siege commander as a marshal character with more attacks per round is obviously advantageous as well. But like a rogue, for instance, um, if a rogue is piloting, they have their cunning action. So they have a little bit of additional action economy that you can use their bonus actions. Like if your ship is being boarded, the, the 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 rogue could potentially be piloting the ship, moves in a position, uses uh, a bonus action for a dash action to close distance with an enemy that's on board ship, sneak attack him, use the rest of his normal movement to get back to the helm of his ship, jump back into the helm, and then move the ship some more if you have any movement speed left, while issuing a command to your team to uh, to like load a weapon as a reaction, like load that weapon for the next volley that we're gonna fire. And then the fighter can take over. It's like, Rogue, thanks for reloading that weapon. Fire, fire, fire. If I can keep hitting my reload DCs, I can fire off three rounds that round with that ballista and then wade into combat with, uh, with the enemies that are aboard my ship to prevent them from getting to my weapon siege crew, for instance. So you can have all these things working at the same time. And when we're looking at when we're looking at the map, if you're existing at three on the on the the three scales at the same time, right? 
at this scale, this 500 foot scale, these ships are just occupying one square each because they're at most 250 feet long. So if you're in a dogfight with another ship, while you're using action economy to maneuver your ship around at the 500 foot scale and fire volleys of siege weapons at each other, you can on the other map at the same time be, I, we'll, we'll get back into it here, uh, at this uh, at this five foot scale, you can be maneuvering around and fighting creatures aboard your deck, and then at the fifty foot scale, that's that's where ship melee combat happens, like like ram attacks, grappling attacks. Uh, we also have fighter craft that are fifty feet or smaller as well uh, that you see in the illustration here. This is a flitter ship that is a, that is a fighter craft that occupies a fifty foot space here, but has the same can can fly hundreds of miles per round. So it can easily engage at the 50 and 500 foot scale as well. Or you can just drop it onto the deck and unload Marines onto this deck and start attacking here. So you can actually operate at all three, uh, at all three scales at the same time, depending on how your team wants to break up their action economy. It works pretty well. Bob's your uncle. So yeah, yeah, nice. I really like it. It's uh, really interactive and benefits teamwork be uh, between PC actions and turns. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So instead of having a separate initiative for ship combat, you operate both ship roles and personal actions at the same time. Yeah, it's it's super fucking fun. We had to uh, we had to recalibrate all the damage uh, of weapons so that we could have a smooth curve from the five foot scale, the fifty foot scale, the five hundred foot scale, so that as you're looking at the different size of ships and the different scale of battle, it's all using the same language. It's just the scale of damage and distance changes as you move from one map to the next. And then you have to compensate for, well, if you can just freely use a siege weapon, what's not to have me just have a boulder lob in and just squish the enemy captain that's aboard the ship and knock him out as a commander? Well, if he's on a ship, he's gonna have at least partial cover. And if you have partial cover, you can't be shot at with siege weapons. Now you need a fighter craft. You need this fighter craft because it uses mounted weapons, like from the Infernal War Machines and Descent into Avernus. Harpoon Flingers deal 2d8 damage, 2d8 piercing damage up to 150 feet away. So that's a serious threat to a lot of creatures on the deck of a ship. If you have a flitter ship that has, you can see here, it has both a ballista and it has a mounted weapon aboard. This thing can just strafe along this this uh, hammerhead ship, and it can use its it can just rotate to its side and just go pop, 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 and have crew on the on the mounted ship just start flinging harpoons into anybody that they can see open on the deck because those weapons are small enough from Descent into Avernus to be able to target individual creatures that are on different infernal war machines. These are just really big infernal war machines, but they basically use the same mechanics. We just had to recalibrate all the damage so that you could use infernal war machines and spell jammer ships and five foot characters all on the same action economy with the same scaling. Or, or different scales, different damage at different scales. So it all curves together elegantly. It's just a matter of what am I focusing my attention on and what do I need to do? Like if an Anyogi attacks you with a Spiderling, the Spiderling ship's about 40 feet long and it's got eight legs that you can use as piercing attacks to stab into your ship so you can't be shook off. And then it can just dump Umber Hulks onto your deck. And then it can lift off and then start shredding your siege weapon, uh, your, your siege weapons, or your um, or or your your ship all together, while you have Umber Hulks running around on deck, smashing stuff and knocking over uh, ballistas and hypnotizing your commanders, so you can't issue commands anymore. It's 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 a really dynamic, fluid system that rewards you thinking about what are my threats that are coming in and what do I need to do to eliminate them. And the team all again all works together so that they can. They can try to like play keep away at the 500 foot scale. Like I don't want that Umber Hulk on my deck. So my priority is to keep distance and to use disengage and to, and to stay, stay far away and just use ranged weapons to shoot it down. But if that flitter, if that spiraling can get inside of your atmosphere, inside of your gravity plane, and it and it hits you it can sink its alignment it can align its gravity with you so you can't shake it out it stays inside of there until you can either um uh, scuttle it so that it's its pilot loses concentration and then you can slide away from it uh, or you have to take an action to like break the grapple 
that the that the flitter ship has attached to your gravity field so you can use the same grappling mechanics from five foot scale with creatures and you can upscale them with grappling siege weapons like grappling claws piercing rams um spider legs to, to grab ships and that becomes grappling like you know it is at the five foot scale but it's being conducted by ships occupying 500 or 50 foot spaces so that grappling's a serious threat because once you're grappled you have to break free of the grapple meanwhile they've got troops that are coming down the grap the, the grappling lines or the or the piercing ram that's grappled you with a piercing attack you can just unload trips from one ship to another through that grapple so this 50 foot scale is incredibly dangerous because if you get tagged at this scale that lets them automatically drop into the five foot scale and start dumping troops onto your deck so you got to really be paying attention do i want to get in that kind of a fight or not and if i don't i probably want to run away which triggers a pursuit where ships can try to maintain relative distance to you at the 550 or five foot scale, whatever scale it was when you decided to break and run. If they use a reaction to pace you, then you can increase speed with them, but you're still maintaining that relative distance. Like pod racing, man, you're streaking at 10,000 miles per hour through space, but you're only five feet apart. So you've got this like intense, super fast race that's going on, but the scale stays exactly the same. It doesn't change, except that you're moving at incredibly fast speeds. And then we have drifting mechanics so that the D&D says that you eventually slow to a stop if you're just free floating in the void, you just eventually stop. So we had to build up the mechanics for how long does it take for you to drift to a stop when you're starting at a certain speed. So if your ship, like if, you're, if your helm gets depowered and you were in a pursuit, your ship's still gonna drift along at that speed until moment inertia eventually slows you down. Um, so you can you can do things like uh, like uh, like Battlestar Galactica tricks where you can rotate your ship 360 degrees while you're still moving in this direction, but you can spin your ship around so you can put all weapons firing behind you as your ship is as your ship is moving in that direction. All you gotta do is establish a speed and let it flow. And then the pursuit can happen. You can just engage ships by movement on the map is just depicting how far away are you from that ship as, you do, as, you're, as you're dodging through canyons and stuff. As you're flying through an asteroid field at 1,000 miles per hour. Then you can use your relative distance to each other just to explain, how, like, am I, gonna, am I ramming your ship? I'm, using, I'm making a ram attack because I'm, I'm trying to you know, batter into your ship and knock out your concentration, which will have you scuttled but that drift is gonna have you end up slamming into an asteroid anyway because your momentum is just gonna continue carrying you forward. And if I can disable your helmsman's concentration, if you're flying through an asteroid field and I can disrupt your concentration, you're gonna end up wrecking your ship by like, taking falling damage, smashing into an asteroid, unless that asteroid is smaller, in which case the asteroid will take damage from your ship. So it's just a matter of scale. So we have all those mechanics in the exploration section down below on how to navigate through stuff like that. But it's, it's, you basically have to take the entire combat section and movement adventuring section, exploration section and spell casting section from the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guide and rewrite the entire chapter to deal with things at 50 and 500 foot scale instead of just a five foot scale. But I'm seriously rambling. So hopefully that makes sense. But that's that's the goal. That that's our goal. That is uh, to to explain how that stuff works. So we started off with maps and movement, scaling movement. How fast can these things move in different periods of time? And once you get down to around, that's a ridiculous amount of space. So now we have to think about scaling down slower speeds inside of a round. And at the 500 foot scale, that's the largest scale you can operate and still be able to engage each other with weapons. If you're over a mile away, you can see weapons coming from over a mile away. You just get out of the way and it's not a problem. So you have to be within the 500 foot scale to even engage in combat at all. Otherwise you're in a long range pursuit, which we talk about later. So once you have your scale established, inertia shock punishes you for trying to change scale too far too fast. If I wanna go from standing still to 10,000 miles per square, um, then that's gonna cause inertia shock, which is gonna force me to make a constitution saving throw. If I botch my constitution saving throw, I'm gonna disable my helm for a round and I'm not gonna go anywhere. And I'm gonna power down and get my ass kicked by whatever I'm trying to run away from. 
So as you gain levels, these constitution saving throws get easier and easier. So a really skilled pilot can do something like do a starburst from standing still to a thousand miles per round. Just yeet like Star Trek and shit or, or Farscape, you know, you, but you have to be good at it. Otherwise, you're just going to shock yourself in the process. So at low levels, you're an easier target. High experience characters, no problem. Um, then now that we establish what scaling movement is, then we look at the scales that are only relevant to ship combat, 500, 50, and 5 foot. What weapons you can use at each scale, whether they're ranged attacks or ship siege weapons at the 50 foot scale or at the 5 foot scale using mounted siege weapons, uh, mounted um, melee weapons or individual creatures attacking with their swords and stuff at the 5 foot scale. Now that we have established what those things are, how do you organize operating amongst these different scales at the same time, which is what the Unorganizing Combat Maps page is about. And now that we know how to organize our maps and we know why we're changing from one scale to another and the limitations on being able to do so safely from round to round, what exactly do I need to do during a round of combat to change scale with a target? You gotta be close enough to it and you have to have movement available that while you're moving, you say, I change scale to 50 feet so that I can close distance with this thing, which is why when you change from the, um, which is why when a ship moves to a square adjacent to a target at the 500 foot scale, you can close distance by placing it and the target on the 50 foot scale map five squares apart. And if you choose, use any remaining movement. If that space is occupied, then you place the target in the next farthest square relative to your position on the map, and which will um, have uh, an illustration here showing two ships that are five squares or more apart. So that places you on the next map, and then you can continue using your movement. And if you have enough movement left to go from the 50 foot square to then be when you move, when a ship moves to a square adjacent to a target at the 50 foot scale, you can close distance by placing it and the target on the five foot scale map, five squares apart. And if you choose, use any remaining movement. If, uh, and if that space is occupied, place the target in the next part of the square relative to your position on the map. And then at the five foot scale map, this is the closest scale that you can have. So, um, if a sh and then if a ship wants to exit to a larger scale, you can do that at any time. But again, you have attacks of opportunity. If I'm trying to move away from you at high speed, then I'm going to, uh, unless I use the disengage action, I'm going to draw attacks of opportunity from the ship that I'm already adjacent to, like at the 50 foot scale. It could potentially attack me with a grappling ram, uh, grab hold of me as, a, as part of the attack. And now I try, to, I try to yeet out of there. Now I'm tethered to this other ship. I now have to figure out, can I even, can I even do that? Like if this ship is so big that I can't tow it, I'm stuck and now I'm grappled and my movement speed ends because I've been grappled by the opportunity attack and I'm stuck here. But if I like, if I evade the opportunity attack or if they skip the opportunity attack and instead pace me, I could be at the five foot scale and I may have just jumped to hundred miles per round. But since they're pacing me as a reaction, I'm still right there five feet away is that they saw it coming. So they just keep speed with me. Now I'm in a pursuit because I'm trying to dodge and outrun this guy and he's trying to pace me, staying in relative position so his crew can keep jumping back and forth among the ship at a high speed chase or whatever. So that's that's the skinny of all of this. This is how this shit works. And then once, but this is as far into, like we have a hundred pages, but I need to break this text up into more pages so you can visualize what we're talking about. So the next page that we're gonna be working on when the stream ends, we're gonna be working on, well, we have facing and maneuvering where it basically talks about hovering and perfect maneuverability like a pixie in a five foot square in a dungeon. That's basically what ships can do while they're being piloted. If you're towing something, you can only turn up to 90 degrees at a time like a boat because you're, when you're towing stuff, you're acting like a boat. You've got stuff that's dragging behind you so you can only turn so much at a time and you have disadvantages on inertia shock like all that stuff is in here and then so there's a distance there's a difference between closing distance with a stationary object where you're basically circling it or zooming in because it can't go anywhere so you have to slow down as you get close to a if you're going to go a thousand miles per round and you don't slow down within when you're within five feet of something that's stationary 
you're probably going to smash into it and wreck your ship. There's a chance that happens. Or if you're closing distance with a moving target, you're basically just catching up to it or moving in relation to where it's at as, as you're both moving forward. You can rotate around each other like, like you know, like a car chase. That's, what we, that's the next thing we have to break up all this text into this next page. And then once we have the closing distance with the different types of targets resolved, uh, we get to get rid of all this scrap language that we've been trying to explain all this crap for the past week. Now that we've got it all figured out, we're almost done with figuring that stuff out. So we can get past all this stuff. And now we can start talking about opportunity attacks, pacing, uh, maintaining a pursuit, uh, talk about mixing maps and, and theater of the mind to optimize your table space available, or like if you don't like if you don't have any um, any um, ship melee weapons uh, that operate at the 50 foot scale, you can just skip the 50 foot scale altogether on your maps if you want. Um, there's charging where you're moving 500 feet per square, but you're on a 50 foot square map. So one square of distance equals 10 squares at the 50 foot scale. But if you're moving that much, why are you at the 50 foot scale? You should actually be at the 500 foot scale if you wanna move that much. The only reason to be at the 50 foot scale is because you're trying to close distance with something, which means that you're staying within 500 feet of it. If you're trying to get away from it, just increase your scale and get the fuck away. So that's that kind of talks about charging. And then there's aligning gravity planes where if I tag your ship, I can ride your wake and you can't get rid of me until you can shake me free. Uh, then there's the opportunity attacks and disengagement stuff that you're used to. And that all kind of falls underneath the maintaining relative distance category. And then once we get done with that, then we got the pacing mechanics and how that works with pursuit. And, uh, and that's all the movement rules involving ships. So we started with equipment, like what's a spell jamming helm? How do ships work in this system? Then we go into mapping. How does mapping and scaling work inside of the system during combat? Now, what's how do you move on those maps? What are the special rules involving combat and movement, pacing, opportunity attacks, charging? Uh, once we resolve all that stuff, what do my characters need to do to make use of that? That dives into the ship roles. The first role we talk about is the pilot and how pilot checks work. And what and like why do you make a check and what are your saving throws are like and taking damage for a ship as a as a combatant, all the shit that goes into that, the options that you have using your action economy. And this is just tight framing. I'll probably actually break this up into more pages so I can add little diagrams and, and illustrations in here as well. But currently all this text breaks down properly onto the page. So then my job becomes what visual assets do I need to add to this, this text information so I can help your brain learn in two paths at once so that you'll grok it easier. And that may require me to, like, to, to create like this much space on this page right here. So this move stuff, that all gets pushed down here, which is gonna push all this stuff over onto this section, which means the siege commander role is gonna get pushed down to here, which means the sidebar about command checks gets punted to the next page. I haven't sorted that out yet. All of this document moving forward is just breaking down space economy. Like where, where do I think the assets can fit on the page and leave enough room open for me to be able to develop those diagrams and illustrations to be able to explain how ship combat works. But like here we're talking about grappling weapons and the different types of siege grappling weapons versus mounted grappling weapons for the different size vehicles, vessels, uh, like a hammer ship or a mounted grappling weapon on a craft, like a skiff or a flitter or spiderling ship. Fighter crafts use mounted weapons. Uh, sometimes if they're big enough, you can put like a, a ranged ship weapon on it. Like for instance, a, um, a mangonel or a trebuchet, you know, or a ballista or a gift giant cannon. Like these things require a lot of space. So you have to have a ship big enough to use them. If your ship is too small, you can't have any. So anyway, that's the ideas behind that. So right now what we're trying to do is figure out how can we um, start expressing stuff on this page. So what map is this? Background, we don't need the background anymore. We got this and we can go here. We can go to save as here equals uh, this will be, oh wait. 
That is this one. That's not the one we wanted. This is the one we wanted. File. Save as. Glad to hear it. I, I don't check my sidebar too much, so sorry for being a lag in, in our conversation. But uh, great. So really uh, nice. I, I really like this. It's uh, really interactive. Thank you. It's taken me um, over a year to develop this. We started, do we started building these mechanics for the Infernal War Machines, the Mad Max trucks, and descent into Avernus, right? We, fit, we basically use these mechanics to build giant war rigs and like war wagons and like semi trucks that are bristling with siege weapons to attack demons and stuff. And then when Spelljammer released in August last year, it only took about 10 minutes for us to look at it. And it's like, oh wow, this, all the mechanics that we built for Descent into Avernus work perfectly for Spelljammer. All we have to do is increase the scale from the 50 foot range for um, Infernal War Machine, Mad Max trucks, increase it from the 50 foot scale to the 500 foot scale, and that, that resolves vessels. So, but there's all the little things like this is zero G. They have 100, they have perfect maneuverability versus um, like trucks and cars. They, they have a turn radius that you have to worry about, kind of like boats. So, there was additional language that we had to flesh out. And that took about maybe five months for us to build out this 100 page document. Like, how does distancing and visualization stuff work? How does moving through a cloud work? What does gravity on a planet work like? Like all the rules that were in Spelljammer by Wizards of the Coast 5th edition were so trite and hollow that like the base frame was there, but it's like they didn't have the extra 100 pages to publish all this crap. So we did it. That's what we're doing. And we make it again, 100% free preview. So you can see all this stuff and you can decide for yourself in the marketplace, is this valuable? If yes equals buy, and then you get all the ship tokens and maps that we built for Lattice Araxis and for you to play on your own maps. We give you a shitload of assets to make this stuff easy for you to use. But if you don't think it's a good idea, you'll have at least have a chance to read the entire thing to determine for yourself if it's valuable or not. And that's how I, all my books are. All the books I have in my description down below, they're all 100% free preview, but most of them have tokens and different assets that you get when you buy it to make using it easier. So I'm particularly proud of the five color mana spell point variant rules so you can play Magic the Gathering inside of D&D using color mana. That was a big accomplishment and I still sell that one every week even though the entire thing is free. Um, I, have, I have a pay what you want for color mana spell point warlocks and that is 100% free preview. You don't have to pay any money for it. Uh, but it's almost a gold seller. It's not like It's got like 450 purchased sales just because... And I, and I haven't gotten a lot of feedback about this, but I'm getting the impression that if you give everything every to everyone up front and just ask them to pay a decent price if they value it, they do. <laughs> it's it's almost like gamers appreciate people building stuff that makes sense. So it's it's been an incredible blessing, and uh, and I'm I, I just I'm thrilled. So everything is really panning out, and if people have a chance to take a look at this and what it does. Um, I think it's really going to make Spelljammer a lot more fun. And then you can do cool shit like play Descent into Avernus as a space, as a space opera where um, like Elturel is floating in a bubble and then uh, the, the demons have a fleet of scorpion ships that they use to attack or something. Um, that's, that's a long-term project that I'm looking forward to doing. But uh, let's see, where are we? Interior pages, that's where we are. But that is the step that we're attempting to accomplish here. So, and then you guys get, you know, you, you get to see the whole process of me building it. So, uh, it's going a little slower than I wanted to, but I didn't realize I would need, uh, I would need to recalibrate how the, how the page lays out so much. But luckily with so many art assets already produced at the front end of this thing, while we were waiting for Adam, our editor to finish, Adam Hancock is our editor. He did uh, orcs and uh, an elephant and an orc have a baby. He also built the, uh, Baldron's Guide to, uh, to uh, Kingdom Building. Um, great guy, too. So, good editing. Um, while he was editing this, we got uh, we got to build the cover, uh, as well as uh, build all the ship tokens and the map assets for Lazaraxes. And now we can just use all that, we can just import all that stuff as um, uh, to, fill the, to, to fill illustration space. So of the, like the 80 illustrations this book is going to need, maybe only 20 of them need to actually be illustrations. 
and the rest of them can be ship movement and combat diagrams. That is really useful visual information to help make sure the system is what's being prioritized. And then when I see like little spots where I can put cool artwork, then I'll, I'll put cool artwork in the spots and I'll do all that here on stream with you guys too. So duplicate this layer, five, and it should be here now. Yep, there's our grid. And then I can uh, delete the layer mask. I do not, oh my God, I don't have a timer going and it's almost 11 o'clock. So I am, I only have 20, I only have 20 minutes left today. I, uh, I spent this session ranting about stuff that I think is cool with you and didn't get a lot of art done. So that, but that's, that's Saturday. Saturday stream is kind of like that. So I, I'm not actually upset about that at all. It's uh, it, honestly, it's, it's every time I get a response like yours, like, this is cool. I get it. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I had 15 people play testing and every single one of them, their response was, this, uh, this is cool. I want to see this. We're waiting for this. So yeah, makes total sense. Yeah. So this, th your response is the exact response I've gotten from everyone that's taken time looking at this. It is very fulfilling and, uh, and it's been an incredible amount of work to be able to produce and it's not done yet, obviously, but it's every, every time I have a conversation like this, it, it just inspires me to, to just to fight through it and make it make it just fucking happen. And I keep showing up on stream to show you where I'm at and to show you that it's fucking happening. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, and then we're doing the same thing with an Eberron adventure. We're, we're building out maps for, for Eberron and we built a, a unique, uh, um, adventure. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's, I think is also super cool, but, uh, I'm biased cause you know, me and, and Andy Heedley, we wrote it. So we're a little biased in general, but um, let's see. One, two, I wanna build out. I'm gonna map, we're gonna block that off like this. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Should, oops. Should be able to be like that. Get rid of the rest of this. Let's do a let's do a spot check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, this is the most. This is by far the most. I mean, I thought color mana was complicated uh, to like was difficult to produce, but this is way more difficult to produce. Color mana, by the way, is ridiculously simple. If you're an MTG enthusiast, you should totally check those books out. Because um, the color mana system is so fucking stupid simple. It just took, it, it just, you know, you just have to think things through. <laughs> so that's what we do. We think things through and then we write about it. That's, that's, that's our game. Why do you have, why are you off like that? There you go. But this is way, way, way more in depth than what color mana was like it, it like it, as it, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It, the mechanics are simple. I'm just saying it was uh, a very difficult task to be able to produce it. It's far more in depth and has a lot more things to consider than just changing how mana works. Like, like how do you fuel, you know, how do you fuel a spell? You, you spin a point of red mana and you, and you, and you cast burning hands. It's pretty simple. Well, I don't have any red mana. Well, you can't cast burning hands right now. So I mean, that's pretty simple. But, uh, but this stuff is like way more in depth because they have to rebuild all of the combat spell casting and uh, adventuring sections of, of the player's handbook in DMG basically to make this stuff work properly. And that's a lot to ask. It's not surprising. It doesn't surprise me at all that Wizards of the Coast didn't do this. Like I'm a hobbyist. I can afford to invest a year of my life into making these things work and playtesting them. They don't have that ability. They are creating swift, simple rules, knowing that somebody like me is gonna come along and figure out how to do this stuff. And like hiring me, like they can't afford, they, 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 they can't afford to have me on their staff because I'm doing deep dives like this that are only interesting to people that are unhappy with Spelljammer in the first place. The market share is like at best 20% of the overall, uh, the overall scope of the market assuming that they're even interested in the first place. That's wizards would never do that. They, they may pat me on the head someday and say, you've, you've done great work, kid, but I don't expect them to ever hire me, but maybe another company would, you know, if, 
if I ever wanted to quit my day job. But honestly, I just enjoy being a hobbyist. So I get to, I get to keep my own schedule. I get to work on what I work on. And the teams that uh, I, I, uh, I hire to help me make these things kind of kind of get, it takes a while to build them. So there's no spider grudge coming from anybody. Everyone gets to see my progress practically every day. So everyone knows that I'm working on it and I'm not fucking around. So the commitment's there. If I eventually get into Kickstarters, this is a really great example of like the kind of commitment and dedication I'll put into your money to make the thing I said I'll build, I'll build. Here's 400 pages of content that prove I can pretty much build whatever the hell I, I put my mind to. So kind of like Forge from the X-Men, but with text. So here's our 10 by 10. Uh, for example, if a 50 foot scale map is placed on a 10 by 10 grid, your ship and target must be within 500 feet of space uh, for this map. So now I can just go in here and let's grab, uh, let's grab some vessel tokens. Here's a here's a star moth at the uh, at the 50 foot scale. It occupies a uh, one two three four. It occupies a four by four space at the 50 foot scale. So that gives it a, a melee reach of 100 feet. Um, half your half your ship space rounded up is your melee reach in combat. So a 200 foot long flitter ship, and this is a this here on the front end is a slashing ram. It does, uh, on this ship, at this scale, it does, uh, let's see, D4, D6. It does D6 times 10 damage on a casual hit. Um, so it does about the same amount of damage as a melee attack as a mangonel does uh, as a ranged attack. Uh, if I'm ramming with it, like say, moving 500 feet before hitting you, then it does 3D6 times 10 damage. It does a ridiculous amount of damage. So this is a this is probably a good ship to grab. So we'll do this, copy, duplicate the group into the 15 foot scale. I can get rid of this now. No, do not save. Here's my ship. Here's our 50 foot scale. And these are all the tokens that are provided with the book when when you when you purchase it. So, I mean, you can screenshot and steal stuff from them if you want to, but it's not very expensive. So, I mean, you know, do whatever you need to do. It's, I, I put it there out for, there for you to use. And I'll probably eventually put all these assets up on my face, uh, on my, um, um, if this, if this thing goes gold, let's, let's say, let's just go ahead and make a promise right now. If I sell 500 copies of this, I'll put all the visual assets on my, on my Patreon and you can just have them for free. But, uh, but I need to make sure that my editor and my co-writer, jo uh, Joseph uh, Ukulele Bard, I need to make sure they get paid, which means I need, to have, I need to have 500 sales, gold status, so they can get a good chunk, you know, thousands of dollars for having helped me build this thing. They deserve that. But if we can hit gold, I'll put all my assets for free on my, uh, on my Patreon. Um, you can just download them at will, but I need, I need to hit that benchmark so that my crew can get paid. Uh, but in the meantime, we're building ship assets. So there's a star moth and let's, um, let's grab a hammer ship. Duplicate this layer. Nope, didn't want to do it that way. I want to duplicate this group and we can go to the 15, page 15, back to page 15, free transform. Flip vertical. I'll have to rebuild those grids so that it's only two pixels wide so it stays grid-like. But you're getting the gist. Fighter craft, craft tokens. Here's our fighter crafts. There's our spiderling. This is the five foot scale, right? This is a, a 50 foot square here. The spiderling fits inside of it. It has a ballista and two mounted weapons, uh, uh, harpoon flingers. Plus each of these legs is a piercing ram. So this does uh, one, two, three, four, 
Uh, this does uh, D10, uh, 2D10 damage. Uh, per per strike and it's a piercing ram so if it stabs and if it hits it can pierce and stay wedged inside of your ship so it has a grip we call it hold ships that are too small to grapple things but have succeeded in a grappling check still need to be broken free from so they aren't weighing you down when your ship's trying to move or so you can get them out of your damn gravity field so you can get away from them but this ship is too small um here um I'll just, I'll just grab this one. It's not the right one to use, but it's a great example. Uh, duplicate that to 15. Okay. Oops. Let's, uh, let's merge this down. Get rid of the side view. Right. And then this is going to be... So this is how this looks at the 50 foot scale, right? And I could, in the 50 foot scale, if I was, con if as a DM, I'm controlling this, zip, I can just land this motherfucker right here on deck. <laughs> and now I've got a spider, I've got a spiderling crawling around on your ship. And if I, if I use my piercing ram attacks here in my front and I stab your ship and I deal damage, I'm, I'm latched onto you. And now you can't shake me free. Until until you can break my concentration and shake me off the ship, so ugh, I can't get rid of the fucking spider on my back. <laughs> so, so then you might want to zoom into the five foot scale here, and uh, and and so th this is the it starts to get a little pixely at this scale, but uh, but that's okay. It's uh, it's just pixel art, so whatever. Uh, I could also I could also play with a filter to uh, to smooth out the pixelation, but as it sits right here. Um, this is a five foot, like on a, on a five foot scale map, this is 60 feet, you know, uh, 40 feet some odd long. So this all scales out properly. I could take a, a soldier here. Um, let's, let's do that actually. Um, let's go to our NPCs and let's grab uh, an elf warrior and, uh, duplicate that group and punt that over to the 15 foot scale. There you go. Oops. Oh, back in. Merge that group. There we go. I mean, I, I know it needs a, a white background and everything, but there. Quick and sloppy. But yeah, this guy could jump from this ship, go up these deck. Uh, we're at the five foot scale here. So he could walk over here and he can start attacking a weapon crew if he wanted to, or um, he could crawl up on deck here and, and jump onto this mounted weapon and start firing at the firing into the crew here um, or you could run back deck here go up these stairs and attack this weapon crew over here or climb down this ladder and then go below deck like this all this all works together it all it all works together so cool shit this is this is what we're building this is what we're building thank you no it's just, like I, it's this is this is this is as much promotional content as it is actual asset production. So I, I, I honestly, I love talking about it. People don't know what I'm doing. I only have 155, maybe 156 subscribers. And uh, so like, I, I'm, I'm like nobody. I am nowhere in this game system. Like I have no reputation. I'm just a guy that builds shit. And, um, and I'm hoping that maybe doing this stuff can get the word out more about what I'm doing, that you can do so much more with fifth edition 
than what than what's being offered by by most by by Watsi or or most third party publishers. Like this is the power of Five E. This is why I love Five E. I love the assets in D and D. That's why I'm still working on the DMs Guild for table scraps. Uh, but I'm hoping to be able to build up a mo enough momentum of people who get what I'm trying to do that I can eventually start doing Kickstarter projects and offer you art assets and stuff like that and payment for helping support the project. God willing, seven years from now, I can quit my day job and do stuff like this for a living instead. But it starts small. It's always very, dreams are tiny in the beginning. So, um, but you have to do good work. If you don't do good work, you don't deserve anything. Like people will say all the time, I worked really hard on this project. It's like, no one gives a crap how hard you work. The end result is what's important. Impress me with your results, please. And, uh, and so that's what we strive to do here. So, but these are the incorrect assets to use in this map. This is gonna be Hammerhead Ship versus Star Moth and Flitter. So let's go grab a Flitter. Like no one gives a crap how hard I work. But if I do a good job, I can impress people with the results. So that's that's the dream. There's our flitter. I'm going to duplicate this. Damn it, that wasn't what we we're supposed to do. I'm going to duplicate the group. We are so we are so close to out of time. <laughs> but I really love the opportunity to walk through this, show you guys where I'm at. Um, I only basically stream for like an hour-ish on Saturday. Uh, I'm I'm on Monday through Friday in the morning for two hours uh, while I'm drinking coffee and waking up before my day job begins. Uh, I do art assets in the morning on uh, Mondays and Thursday night. I do uh, art assets as well. And I bounce between Spelljammer and uh, Ebron uh, uh, Adventure Design. It's all the same, it's all this same sort of stuff. Just Undead and Eberron, basically, uh, is what the adventure is centered on right now. And I'll eventually be doing a, a mountaintop um, monk monastery that gets attacked by elemental creatures that I'll build into an adventure as well. And uh, it'll have, it'll, it'll be similarly fun. Like, see how small that flitter craft is in comparison to that star moth? You can literally strap these things to the underside of a star moth. Like, hold on, let me, let me make that work here. Like you can have a ship hooked here and, uh, and I can have, uh, duplicate the layer. I could hook another one here. So you can have like these shuttle craft. Look how, look how those lines curve together. Look how elegant that is. Ah, oh, I love how well these assets are all built for each other. But yeah, you can have these little things basically stuck to the undercarriage the underbelly of spell jammer ships, you have that, that, that gravity plane, right? Gravity goes up, gravity goes down, and you, you can be upright on both sides of it. That underbelly of almost all ships is completely unused space. Some do, but most don't use it at all. That's all, that, that's all landing space. You can just land your ship. You just, just like if this, if this was the underbelly, um, you can just land your, uh, land, land your flitter ship on the bottom of the deck and then just, you know, pop over to the top side and, and get on board. So it's, you can, you can have multiple ships like this stacked up underneath your vessel. Basically as care, you become a carrier ship. Uh, the, uh, the Elven Armada from second edition is a, uh, is a 100 ton ship, which basically fills a 500 foot space. Um, let's, uh, let's look at that real quick. Cause that makes me geek out. Here's the Armada. Here's the illustration from second edition, right? Here's the floor plan that we've started to build. Here's the five, here's 50 foot squares, right? So this is the 500 foot scale. Um, and, uh, and, and here's a, a tiny little flitter that we built. Like you could stack up shitloads of these things on this deck, right? These are all little flitter ships here. You see, now they have these little things on deck here. So when we build this out, we can have uh, a flitter deck here and another flitter deck back here. And these will be like, like the flitters that we have fill a 50 foot space, right? 
but they're more like shuttle ships or, or like transports or like like marine drop ships. So so flitter probably isn't the right phrase, but this is how big the flitter we have on the other map. This is how big it would be here. So these are like shuttle, shuttle ships, but we also have uh, we also have craft that are like uh, like the goblin arrow, for instance. The uh, the goblin arrow is only. A, a 15 by 15 foot craft. So it would easily be able to, like if I built a flitter this small, it could still have room for a ballista to be able to harass uh, larger ships. But on the Armada, like that little flitter ship, that would be, that. that's, you can see here, this is 50 feet, right? That's a 50 foot square. This little flitter ship is about 20, it's like a 20 by 20. So it's like a little bit bigger than what this arrow is. So when I build the Armada, oh, there's my timer. When I build the Armada floor plan, and I release that as, as basically a, a bragging piece to add on to this, this ship mechanics that we've been doing, I can build little 20 foot um, fighter craft that will be decked out on this. And this will be like a CR, like this would effectively be like, unless you have a fleet with you, your characters are probably gonna need to be around 15th level to take this thing on. Just because the amount of combatants that are going to be shredding your pilots are uh, your hit points to keep your ship from being destroyed. It's just going, it's going to, it's going to tax you a lot, but that's the kind of crap that we can do with this system. And it's fucking cool. So anyway, that's uh, now I'm just geeking out and half bragging. <laughs> I need to knock that stuff out, but yeah, so this is where we're at. Um, so I'm, it's 11 o'clock, which means. Uh, I'm out of time for the day. I love just ranting about this crap on Saturday. It's a lot of fun. Um, I have to log out. Uh, I've got, I'm, I'm going to have family around, so I, I'm going to have to get off stream, but I still have the opportunity to actually work on things today. So we're going to go back in and, uh, and we're going to uh, go back up and uh, work on the uh, the rest of the, uh, of the movement stuff. And God's willing, by the end of today, I'll have the movement section done and we'll be flowing right back into the, uh, into the ship rolls. So then we continue uh, on Monday through Friday this week. We'll be doing uh, more NPC character art for the different types of creatures that are in Light of uh, And then Monday night we'll be back doing Eberron Cartography and the Underground Necromancy Lab. Uh, and then on Tuesday at lunchtime, uh, we'll be doing the Martial Powers mechanics uh, and we'll be do, we'll probably be building a uh, a monk battlefield disruptor, uh, and then Thursday night we'll be back on for more Ebron cartography, and again Monday through Friday in the morning for about two hours, I do Spelljammer art asset production NPCs for now, uh, and when we get done with the NPCs, we'll, we should be done with all this page layout, and once all the page layout stuff is done. Uh, we'll be able to, to dive in and like, uh, like, uh, where was one? Um, bop, 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 bop. No, that's just a PDF. I know I've got, I know I've got an old strip around in here somewhere. I'll show you real quick before I kick out of here. Production interior art pages, page 11. Yeah. So like here's the, the maps and movement section that we were building out. Here is uh, an image of a ballista crew firing on a Yogi spiderling with a Yogi night spider in the background with asteroids. Like this is the kind of illustration. I mean, this is still super rough, but uh, but if you know my work at all, and you, you probably don't because you know it, people are new all the time. But here's one of the illustrations that we had done in the uh, in the playlist, like around episode. I want to say around episode sixty. Let's see if it's still here. Uh, and this will be the last thing I do and then I'll take off. So uh, let's go to open and let's go to production and we'll go to chapter art. There we go. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a full color illustration that we had built. I don't know if all the art assets are gonna look like this, but this is the kind of work I can produce. And this is an instance of um, uh, mounted knights on the back of, uh, uh, of a scaver, which is a space shark. So I can build these guys out into, uh, into a squadron of, uh, of scaver riders um, using mounted lances, which deal at uh, this scale, it's probably like 2d8 damage, which I think is comparable to a normal lance anyway. But then they could board your deck 
and start, you know, pull out swords and start stabbing your crew as mercenaries, for instance. I could hire these guys and I could keep a pen on the underbelly of my hammerhead ship. I could keep these scabbers and pens underneath my underneath my ship. And so when I want to, if I don't have like a flitter ship or a spiderling fighter craft, I can instead have these mercenaries jump onto their scabbers and, f and then fly off as mounted creatures. Because we have a mounted combat section later on in the book too. So you can do all this stuff. This is all the stuff that you could do with Spelljammer if you have the mechanics to do it, which is what we're trying to do. Anyway, oh man, it's exciting. And uh, so sorry about, uh, sorry about the lack of illustration today, guys. I'll be back on Monday to do more NPC character art. So be welcome to check that stuff out. And, uh, and once, we get the, once we get the layouts finalized, I'll keep touching base with you like I did today about where we're at in the process of, uh, of doing layouts. As you can see, since last week, we've built out one, two, three, and we're working on, yeah, we built out three. Here's our fourth page that we've built out. We're still doing assets for that. So in the past week, we've been able to reformat these four pages, which doesn't sound like a great rate you know, but I only have about three pages left. So I'm hoping today I'll be able to knock out all this stuff and almost all the book is already laid out. So it's just, this was a sticking point. So you can scroll out and you can see how much of this book we already actually have resolved. So, um, really reminds me of those huge Star Wars space battle looks. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, just tons of fighter ships engaging uh, as the huge battleship uh, launch heavy artillery at the at each other and you only have to pay attention to what's immediately surrounding your character um, You can background as much as that stuff is just a battle that's happening and you can zoom in on what What carrier ship you want to destroy or what TIE fighter you want to knock TIE fighters only 30 feet long by the way and X-wings are only 40 feet long so all of those all that uh, Star Wars mechanics that that we love it all fits inside of this one fighter, one starfighter from Star Wars fits inside of a 50 foot square. So all these mechanics were actually designed with Battlestar Galactica, Farscape, Babylon 5, Star Trek, and Star Wars. I was thinking about all that crap. Macross plus Robotech. Uh, once this book is published, I'll be able to build Space Mecha and Gundams. I already know the mechanics. You can check my playlist for the, um, um, uh, for the, uh, fuck, what are they called? I cannot remember what they're called. The, uh, the, the Soulborn things, the, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're basically Space Mecha from second edition. We rebuilt those and we, and we spent a section on it. There's my call. So I gotta go guys. Uh, thanks a lot for being here and I will catch y'all next, uh, on Monday, hopefully.